Hey everyone, thank you for coming to today's Folio Forum, which is sponsored by the Open Library Environment, EBSCO, and Index Data. My name is Eric Cartnett, and I'm the Director of Electronic Resources at Texas A&M University and the host for today's event. Our topic today is the Folio Roadmap Update. Today's session, like all Folio Forums, is being recorded and will be posted to the Open Library Foundation's YouTube channel and to the resources section of folio.org. As an open forum, participants can see participants' names and all questions submitted, and we have muted everyone except the speakers to ensure good sound quality. We value your participation and encourage you to engage in the topic. Please use the Q&A box within Zoom to enter questions and comments as they come to you. If you'd like to tweet, please use the Twitter hashtag Folio Forum. We also encourage you to continue the conversation on this topic on the Folio Discussion website, discuss.folio.org. Our speaker today is Harry Kaplanian, Senior Director of Product Management and Software Services at EBSCO. With that, I'll turn things over to Harry. Hello, everyone. Um, as Eric mentioned, my name is Harry. <laughs> um, I think the best way to describe my role um, on the Folio project is really uh, responsibility or maybe even better facilitator of the project roadmap and of priorities um, based on all the libraries that are currently heavily involved in the project and that do intend to use Folio. Um, this is, I just have a few slides here. Um, it'll, we'll get through these relatively quick. I actually have a total of about five. Um, and some of this will be a little bit of a repeat if you've attended these before, but there is some new material here as well. So please hang on. So, Folio as a platform really brings to the market three key advantages, and these advantages really make it different from everything else that exists in the market. One of them is the fact that it's based on open source and an open business model. Open source in the sense that all the code is Apache V2, which essentially means all the code that we build, that we create, that we write is made available in Git for anyone that wants to take a look at it, anyone that wants to use it, build it, what have you. Um, there's, there's essentially no limitations as far as the code is concerned. It's also based on a microservices architecture. And so many of you are working system with systems today. Many of these systems may have been built 20 years or more in the past. Um, some of them actually maybe 10 years or so in the past. Either case, many of these are based upon the idea of traditional monolithic systems. And so over time, as these systems get more and more complicated, as more and more features get added, it becomes harder and harder to maintain the system, to update the code base, to add the features that you want and need. And they tend to be limited in a sense as well. Folio is based on this modern concept of microservices. It's built and made of replaceable parts and pieces that communicate with each other. And so if there's a piece that for whatever reason doesn't work for your library, um, there ideally in the future will be pieces that replace it. Let's say you're not happy with circulation, you want a different one. You should be able to replace it without replacing the entire system. Um, what's also interesting about this is it gets us to sort of a place where we have a core platform and you know, what does it mean for code to become outdated or old when the different parts and pieces can be replaced as time goes on? And even more interesting as you libraries start to think about where you wanna be strategically five years from now, 10 years from now, as you think about the services you're going to need to provide to your patrons, Folio provides that platform where you can start to build those pieces or those apps that help you fulfill the needs or your needs of your users moving forward. And there aren't really any systems that can say that that exist today. And this idea of a vibrant ecosystem of partners and creating economies of scale. Uh, today, if you're not happy with your vendor, you can switch vendors, but what that typically means is you're doing a full migration to a whole new ILS system. Um, what's interesting about Folio here is there are multiple vendors that are going to be supporting Folio and multiple vendors have already stated they will. And so if you're not happy with someone's services, you can go to someone else um, without migrating to a new system. Uh, the other piece that's really interesting here is we're actually looking at slightly longer term as more features, more functionality, and more apps get built both by community and vendors and others alike. 
that we will end up in a situation very much like an app store, like you do with your smartphone, where ideally you'll be able to choose the parts and pieces that make the most sense for you and your library. Overall, what all of this means is Folio is coming to market to provide choice and choice in the most open way possible. Folio has many feature advantages, but there's three really major key ones here. And one of them relies or relates to metadata formats. Folio is the only system, at least that we know of, that's been really designed from the start to support additional future metadata formats without forcing a rewrite of the entire system. Um, as all we need is a mapping, an import tool, and an editor, and we're done. And so obviously right now, Folio does support MARC. Most likely the next record format we're gonna add is Dublin Core, because there seems to be a lot of interest in that. But in the future, whether it be uh, BibFrame, whether it be um, mods, Mets, whatever the case may be, Folio, should be able to handle it and to be able to handle it relatively easy without rewriting everything. In fact, most applications don't even have to know that additional metadata format has been added. Folio also supports the concept of multiple knowledge bases simultaneously. It's the first system that we know of that isn't built around a single knowledge base. Um, we don't necessarily believe that a single knowledge base can support the needs of all libraries, every libraries, and all the content that libraries need to support. So not only in as time goes on will we be able to mix and, mix and match, but you will be able to actually have multiple knowledge bases connected simultaneously that the system can make use of. In fact, today there are currently two knowledge bases that Folio can support simultaneously, but as time goes on, we expect that to grow. Folio has also been designed from the perspective of it should be able to manage all your content, whether it's electronic, print, IRs, whatever the case may be. Um, all materials should be viewable and manageable from within Folio. You should not need to go out and get a separate ERM system. And um, in fact, within Folio, we really refer to it as resource management, not making the difference between any of the different format types. Um, Folio is first and foremost a platform um, we don't like to call it an ILS um, because in many ways it's not. And the core of that platform is what we call Okapi or the Folio Gateway. And this is really the key switchboard of the system. The core of the API is how everything interconnects. Um, it's also the tenant management piece as well. Folio is designed to be multi-tenant from the start. It's built in, it's intrinsic to the system. In addition, um, we've got apps. We've got what we call our core set of Folio apps, and these are relatively traditional. Cataloging, circulation, acquisitions, functionality, and as I mentioned, resource management. There's an asterisk there because it's all types of resource management. And acquisitions is a bit of a broad um, category. Folio itself is actually made up of multiple apps that provide acquisitions functionality collectively. But then they're really what we call our non-core apps as well, which are union catalog features, digital repositories, OPACs, what have you. And some of these are being built or integrated um, um, as really in many ways a key part of the project. But many of these actually exist and reside as separate projects outside of Folio. But many of these are very active in the Folio community, making sure that their apps and services interoperate. And so for instance, in terms of OPAC, um, the ViewFind um, community is getting involved or has been involved in the Folio community. We know that ViewFind will be able to integrate. Um, ViewFind's interesting because it represents an open source effort, of course, but then there are other organizations that have services that can plug into Folio as well, they don't necessarily have to be open source. And so for instance, EBSCO's um, EDS discovery service also plugs into, directly into Okapi and can communicate and interoperate. But that's an example of a non-open source application that can plug in and communicate. Folio is really open to all. 
real quick here. Um, you should be seeing my web browser. So uh, one of the goals here, of course, is to talk about roadmap and I'm about to jump into that. But I think one of the pieces here that's really important for people to understand is how do we build our roadmap? How do we get this backlog of priorities that we know has to be built. And Folio has a very strong community built on the idea of special interest groups. And these special interest groups cover particular topics um, that are, well, required to operate a library. And quite a long time ago, um, we all got together and built what amounted to a backlog of what we call epics. And these are very high level features, really broad swaths of functionality, or maybe even better domains of expertise that occur in the library. Um, and what we've done is we've identified these and we've prioritized these. However, prioritizing, especially off a fairly substantial group of libraries, is not always the easiest thing to do in the world. And so the way we go about doing it is we actually carry out surveys. And so here's an example of a survey um, that was carried out in SurveyMonkey. And all our high level epics exist here and the community was asked to prioritize this based on what they believe they need um, to be able to actually run their library on a system like Folio. And SurveyMonkey has some limitations, but one of the great things about it is you can export that data. And so we do. And so if we take a look at this just slightly differently, these are exactly the numbers and the epics that were prioritized by the community within Folio, but in the spreadsheet, we can sort them. And so this gives you an idea, really a visual view of what that looks like. And so within Folio, as new teams start or new teams form, um, as new resources are made available to the community, or as certain epics and features are completed, this helps us sort of provide that big picture of what comes next, what are the next things that we've got to be able to build. And so for the most part, uh, there are a few exceptions really due to technical issues or technical difficulties or dependencies, but in general, we go through the list essentially in priority order to knock as many of these out as possible. In addition, this rep well, this represents the high level, but then within each of these topics, like for instance, acquisitions or in agreements or authority control or batch importing, really these are made up of many, many features, much more detailed features, or in some cases, even stories. And we've got an enormous backlog of these as well. Um, these number, I think right now, somewhere between 800 and 1,000. I no longer know the exact number. It tends to change quite a bit. But for instance, if, if we take a look at this, here's a feature, um, cloning opening hours to several service points. Um, if we take a look at this feature, and actually, let me edit this so you can see more detail here. Um, this is very high level. This is, um, many of these are still under analysis. But one of the things we do here is since we all work out of JIRA, this is how we actually track the different features and stories that are being built by the development teams. Uh, we actually have uh, the early adopter libraries get involved as part of this process as well. And so you can see here, for example, where we see the rank by the different early adopter libraries that are heavily involved in this project. And if we take a look at this, they're able to rank these as in what do they need for go live? Um, what can wait for the next fiscal year rollover? What can wait up to a quarter after go live or can wait up to a year or even what's just not needed? And we've got this for all the features within the system, or at least almost all of them. Sometimes as we add a batch of new features, it'll take a little bit of time, but the libraries that are involved in this community do help us prioritize these. And this is really, really important because again, why should we build things, especially if most libraries don't believe they're needed to go live. And also when we look at the overall schedule in terms of when these libraries expect to go live, we can also use that as input as far as how we prioritize these features as well. So what we do then is all this data actually loads into a Google Doc, which we call our capacity plan. 
And here we see the ranking, a value that's created based on the priorities you saw. But then we've got another ranking we apply here, and these are the product owners. And the product owners work very closely with not just the librarians, but the developers as well. And it's their role to really flesh out the details of those features into stories so the developers know exactly what needs to be built. Now, in those discussions with the developers and architects and other technical folks, um, these POs oftentimes learn their dependencies between these features. And so we try to abide by the library and librarian provided priorities as close as we can, but some, sometimes due to um, interactions or dependencies to other features, functionality, or even architecture within the system, those have to change a bit. And that's what we see here as our PO rank. The other thing that's really interesting about this document is in JIRA, we have estimates for all these features. And we also pull in those estimates into the spreadsheet. And when we take those estimates and we superimpose all the development teams that are currently involved within the project, along with the number of days of time that these developing development teams have. And these are broken down into front end and back end developers, because some developers really focus on the user interface elements, where others really focus more on the back end architectural type elements as well. And by providing breakdowns for all these features that are broken down along back end and front end, we're able to apply these across the board as best we can to librarian provided priorities, taking into account technical issues or architectural issues, and we're able to see and relatively easily calculate or come up with reasonable estimates as to what gets done. And so everything that's green here is what's being worked on in the current quarter. Everything that appears in yellow is what we expect based on um, current known um, development effort and developers or development teams that we have on staff and work that needs to be accomplished. Yellow represents what's going to happen in the following quarter. And red, red is a little bit further out. Um, so it would be on the uh, quarter after the current quarter. And so many of those, for instance, as we finish this next quarter, as we go through and do our next round of updates, estimates, and prioritization, many of those red items move into the yellow slots. In some cases, they even move into the green. And ideally, if all goes as planned, most of the yellow items move into green. And um, this is how we're able to estimate or provide reasonable estimates as to what we can expect will actually get done or be built. And let me get back to the PowerPoint. So we're able to take all of this data and we end up with sort of a distillation of all of that at a very high level, which gives us something like this. And these are the milestones that we're aiming for within Folio. Um, this is broken down by quarter, um, as you can see. And then behind the scenes, there's this um, cone or triangle um, that goes from a darker shade of blue to a lighter shade of blue. That represents the code, um, the cone of uncertainty. <laughs> um, in every software project, the things that you've done, you absolutely know about. The things that you're working on, you know the most about. And as you get further and further out in your, time in your timeline in terms of features and functionality and what you expect to build, the uncertainty factor starts to increase. And it increases in many cases quite rapidly. And so all that cone of uncertainty is trying to represent, of course, is the things we know best about are the things we're currently working on, but as you get further and further out into 2020, it becomes harder and harder to predict and therefore a little less reliable. So looking at these releases in January, the beginning of this year, um, we rolled out the Astro release, and this is really what amounts to an early beta. This was early versions of many of the core features that you saw on that previous sort of architectural slide with the yellow apps, um, the blocks. And um, with this release, we saw orders functionality, vendors functionality, which of course make up 
acquisitions, um, some of the basic circulation, inventory, patron management functionality, and then the ability to manage um, contracts, licenses, and packages, but at a very early stage and usage statistics as well. We're currently in Q1, and so we're working on the Bellis release. And really what we're aiming for here is a first library beta. The whole community has decided to align and the single single minded goal is to actually get one library up and running as quickly as possible. And this is really important because it helps us in terms of building a base, a core building block or set of building blocks that all other functionality can be built upon. And we want that core uh, to be performant. Um, we want it to be stable. Uh, we want to make sure that any assumptions we're making about needed features or future features are correct. And the way we do that is by actually having a library adopt it and attempting to go live. So this is really a critical stage for us right now. And again, there's more core feature focus here. Um, Cataloging as well is what we expect to start to roll out. Um, we've been working on discovery, interoperability, import capability, and um, more orders work, but also starting to work on receiving as well, and more usage stats. Now, once this release is done, um, which should happen at the end of this quarter, because it's still a focus really on features, over time, we've built up a certain amount of technical debt. And this is what we expect to tackle in our Clover release, which is the second half of 2019. And this is again, focusing on rolling out for that first library, but now really a really strong focus on stabilization, on performance, on defects that we've accumulated as you always accumulate on any software project. And these are really some of the core development teams focused on that, but that doesn't necessarily mean all development teams are working on that and they won't be. And so we'll be continuing work as well in parallel on invoicing and funds management, additional import features, and also really starting to focus on external integrations, meaning what external systems to the library, what campus systems does Folio need to integrate with? And let's start building those out, starting with the first library to go live, and of course, reusing those for any additional uh, libraries. But then as the rest of the early adopter libraries start to attempt to go live as well, we have additional integrations for them that we've got to work on as well. Which brings us to Q3. And so Q3, ideally, um, we have our first library up and running, but also at the same time now we really need to start to shift focus on some of the other early adopter libraries and many of these libraries are substantially larger. And because of that, that implies more advanced circulation features, some additional features that have yet to be identified relating to acquisitions, more work on licensing contracts and package management, external integrations, batch operations to data within Folio, um, reporting and analytics, and migration tools as well. Because we know we've got uh, libraries that represent multiple pre-existing systems, and we need to be able to get that data out accurately and cleanly and get it into Folio as well. Um, additional work going on in Q4 of 2019 with some stabilization as well, and this is our Edelweiss release. And then starting in Q1 2020, um, Fameflower, and this is now really, really a focus on just those key pieces to get those early adopter libraries up and running. Now also somewhere around a Q3, Q4 timeframe, um, you'll notice here we have license contracts and package management. Um, somewhere in the Q3, Q4 timeframe, we have some libraries that are very much interested in the features that relate to managing electronic resources, or again, um, really um, because Folio doesn't focus necessarily on electronic um, and licensing and contracts can be used for physical items as well. Um, we do have a set of libraries that really want to attempt to go live, bring up these systems and start to run their libraries or at least the management, the day-to-day -day management of licensing contracts and packages as well. So we expect that to happen. All of this leading to the Goldenrod release, which we expect to happen the middle of 2020 or Q2. And this is where we expect to have 
the early adopter libraries to the point where many of them are starting to go live, while at the same time, we're really starting to focus on the much more advanced features that exist in the backlog, um, whether they go through workflow management systems or other features. There's actually a decent list back there that we've got to work on. Ideally, this will give us the time to focus on those. And that is essentially it. And so, um, you know, I'd like to open it up for questions, um, concerns, thoughts. And I see there is a question here. And the question is, um, are there specific libraries that we anticipate adopting Folio right away as testers or early adopters? There are. Um, I should have put the list in this PowerPoint. Um, you can go ahead and take a look at folio.org where there is a list. Um, but that said, the very first early adopter library is going to be Chalmers University in Sweden. And then the next group of early adopters are a core of libraries. And I'm going to apologize ahead of time. I'm not sure I'll be able to rattle off the list. Or Eric, if you need to, please feel free to jump in. Um, but uh, Texas A&M, Cornell, University of Chicago, University of Alabama. Um, we also have the uh, five colleges in New England, um, a consortia, and Lehigh University and um, an additional collection of libraries that are part of the GBV consortia. And um, actually someone just sent me a list here. Let me see who I'm missing. So the five colleges consortium, um, I mentioned Lehigh, uh, the State University of Bremen, um, the ZBW as well, um, in Germany as well, and um, I think at that point, I've got most of them. Any other questions? Ah, one I missed, um, Duke is expected to go up in that time frame as well. Um, also, uh, what is the current status of Folio's compatibility with OCLC, um, especially bibliographic imports? So we're working on what amounts to a standard um, import tool with mapping and everything else, so that will work. Um, we also expect shortly, um, really OCLC represents what we would call those external integrations. Um, and so there's already some services that we're starting to identify that really will Folio, we know, will absolutely positively have to integrate with. Um, again, it really depends, though, especially this early in the project, which are the first libraries to adopt Folio and which services from OCLC are they using, and we'll be diverting resources to get those integrations complete. So there's a question about, um, is the cataloging module using AtCult's WeCat? Um, I can't answer directly relating to WeCat itself, but at Cult is actually building out a cataloging app for Folio, and this cataloging app is open source. So it's not what I would call WeCat. Um, it is actually an additional new tool um, that will be open source, Apache 2. Um, they've actually started to give some demos of this here and there. It includes authority control and really all the major features you expect in a full-blown cataloging tool relating to MARC records. And so that app will exist, and it will exist as really one of the core applications or features that are part of Folio as well. So um, there's a question here. Um, uh, someone finds it very odd that we consider the OPAC as non-core. Um, what system uh, do you expect early adopters to use as their public catalog search? So early on in this project, um, well, I even stated it in a sense in one of the slides earlier. The whole goal behind Folio is really choice. We want libraries to have choice. We don't want you to be forced into a single system. It's designed around the idea of replaceable parts and pieces because you should be able to choose the parts and pieces, one that you use, 
that are appropriate for your day-to-day -day use within the library or what services you actually provide. And then more importantly, what's really critical for your patrons, for your users, what best helps in that area. And so as we looked around, we see libraries all over the world choosing different tools for their OPAC functionality as it relates to discovery layers, for example. And so ViewFind, we know, early adopters are going to use. I believe there's at least one that expects to use Blacklight, and there's actually a good number that actually intend to use EDS. And I know there's also libraries that expect to use ViewFind or Blacklight and EDS API in some cases as well. It's really up to these libraries. We also have um, a consortium of libraries in Germany that actually have an OPAC that they themselves have used for many years. That's their own creation. And they'll be building, excuse me, so it won't be building, it's already built. They will be shortly um, embarking on a project to integrate that with Folio as well. So how do you foresee the project being affected by BibFrame? It's actually already pretty heavily affected by BibFrame. For Folio to be able to adopt additional metadata formats without forcing a rewrite of all its applications and services, Folio has what amounts to really an internal um, native format that it uses for bibliographic data. And what happens, of course, is any mark data or anything else that's loaded into the system, I mentioned earlier, we need an import, we need a mapping, and we need a cataloging tool. That mapping is key because it ties it into that internal structure that Folio uses. So that internal structure is as close as we can based actually on BibFrame. Um, the issue, of course, is um, BibFrame tends to focus more on monographs. And so we've had to make adjustments because of that and other areas as well. Um, but in general, um, BibFrame, you could argue, has a pretty substantial influence on Folio itself. Um, at some point, um, we expect uh, some libraries will expect to import BibFrame and actually edit and maintain BibFrame. And ideally, um, both the import ability and uh, the cataloging tools, um, once they're built, are relatively easy to integrate into Folio. Will there be a Z3950 service? Uh, we will. We know for certain union catalog and resource um, sharing situations, Z3950 is needed. And so although it's in the backlog, officially the development work hasn't started. Um, but one of the organizations um, that is very heavily involved in Folio, um, Index Data, who probably knows Z3950 better than anyone, um, will be embarking on what's needed for Z3950. And we say Z3950 service, meaning Z3950 clients should be able to connect to search and retrieve data from within Folio. Um, in addition to Z3950, um, we just finished OAI PMH support as well for Folio, and that is a service as well. So other OAI PMH harvesting tools, discovery services, um, resource sharing services can also connect via OAI PMH as well, and that can actually happen today with Folio. So which two knowledge bases are currently supported is one of the questions. Currently, there are two. And, um, um, excuse me, um, one of them is EBSCO's knowledge base, and um, um, the other one is, um, oh my gosh. Go KB. Go KB, thank you. <laughs> um, whew, getting tired there, I apologize everyone, but Go KB. And actually what's really interesting about this is Folio can connect to both simultaneously. So um, um, a lot of this, um, pro a lot of the uh, knowledge base work is actually happening um, with some of our partners in Germany um, out of the GBV. And they've actually been able to give demonstrations where they're actually using both simultaneously, which is really exciting. So I'm being asked, is there a piece of folio you can demo today? Um, I did not plan on it, but I can. And um, if need be, um, 
you can contact me directly or other folks within the project and we can set up a demo. Um, the other option is if you're technically inclined, you can actually go to Git and there are instructions as far as downloading the code, building it, installing it, and running it yourselves. But it is a little more of a technical endeavor. Um, at this point in time, I can't say we've got installation programs or anything like that, but there are quite a few organizations and people within the community that are doing it today. Also, at the end of every sprint, because we do operate in an agile type um, process, um, we actually record the sprint demos um, every two sprints, which equates to roughly once per month. And you can actually see the developers um, showing off the new code that's been built as well. So the question was, are there multiple vendors offering service support for Folio? Um, are there others other than EBSCO and Bywater? Um, yes, there are. And as far um, well, as I personally know right now, besides EBSCO and Bywater, Index Data plans to, and I also know um, Adcult expects to as well. And I know there are others, and in some cases, um, you know, we're talking vendors here, but we should expand the scope of what that means because there are consortia entities that are expecting to provide services for Folio as well. And so, for example, um, I did mention um, in Germany, um, consortia there and um, uh, the GBV, and the GBV will be offering services to its members as well. Um, sprint review. Um, okay, this was an question. Someone just posted the link into chat where the sprint reviews are, so you can take a look. And they're also on the OLF YouTube channel as well. <clears throat> and if you go there, you can see the recordings. And there's several other vendors as well that were listed. Um, if anyone's interested, again, it's part of the chat. Don't see the link. Okay, they were just reposted. Okay. Are there other questions? There was, there was one other question you missed uh, asking oh. when would be the next time it'll do a, like a big, a bigger overall demo of the system? Um, that's a good question. Um, Eric, <laughs> do you know, is there anything on the Folio Forum backlog? Because <laughs> <laughs> if not, we probably should have one. Yeah. Um, I, I know that we have things in the schedule, on the schedule, um, but we could probably work something in. Okay. So it sounds like we have a to do there to make sure we have one scheduled and we will do that and we can do that shortly. Um, oh, and Rachel just posted the link of all partners, vendors and early implementers. Any other questions? Any thoughts about the roadmap, the prioritization process? Any questions relating to this diagram? All right. This can wrap things up. Yes. So everyone, thank you very much. And um, so this concludes today's Folio Forum covering the roadmap. We've been live tweeting the forum. For a short recap and links to the resources, look for the Folio underscore LSP Twitter feed. You can continue the conversation at the Folio Discussion website.
discuss.folio.org and on Twitter using the hashtag Folio Forum. The recording of today's forum will be posted to YouTube shortly. Our next Folio Forum is scheduled for February 20th and will be on the topic of the communities within the Open Library Foundation and their connections to Folio. The announcements to register will be sent out in the Folio newsletter and on various listservs. You can also find it in the event section of the folio.org homepage. Thank you again to our speaker, Harry, and to everyone who asked questions and added comments.